awesome opportunity that we have to allow our children to lead us in worship and sing of the greatness of our God. It is out of a, an honor and a reverence for God that we gather here this morning. We, we don't gather to proclaim the gloriousness of anything else in all creation. We gather to worship the God who is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. We are continuing in our study through the Gospel of Mark. And this morning we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 3 beginning in verse 7 and uh, we're going to be going through verse 19 this morning. Let me read from God's Word. We stand out of honor and reverence to God whose Word it is we read. It says this, Mark 3 beginning in verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Would you be seated as we pray together? Father, we know that the need around us is infinite. As we see lostness, as we see disease, as we see uh, oppression, even death, all of the effects of living in a world under the influence and the effect of sin, God, we know that the the need is immense, but God, we also proclaim with boldness that we serve an immense God who is capable of meeting the needs of all who come to him. Father, we pray that your spirit would illuminate the truth of this text this morning, enabling us to see it, enabling us to understand it, and enabling us to apply it in our lives that we might be transformed by it pray this in Jesus name. Amen. This has been a, a difficult season for everyone. You think back to the events of the past few months, I, I know that we have joked that it seems like we, we've been in this season for years, maybe even decades. I, I can't remember a, a time in my life where people were collectively looking forward with greater anticipation to the coming of a new year than we are to 2021. We believe somehow, in some way, and perhaps it's true, that the turning of, of a calendar is going to somehow change things. Because this has been a difficult season. The virus, the shutdown, the economic downturn, the racial tension, the civil unrest, the election that never ends. I, I don't know anyone that would say that this year has been, for them, an easy year. Almost every area of our lives has been impacted in one way or another by the virus that we are continuing to battle. People are stressed out. And yet, even in the, in the face of this 
incredibly difficult year, which for most of us we would say has probably been the most difficult year of our lives. I have heard over and over and over again from Christians that in many ways this has been one of the best years of their lives, that they've realized God's goodness and God's provision and God's mercy and God's blessing in ways that maybe they hadn't previously. Seems like God is giving Christians right now at this point in history a unique opportunity to minister to the world around us because we are those who know that there's hope, there's peace, there's joy, there's confidence and there's comfort and even the the capacity to, to celebrate and to rejoice even in the face of suffering. And, and this, I, I want us to understand, this is uniquely Christian. It's only those whose hope is in eternal things that can look at the temporal and temporary circumstances of difficulty and say, none of this really has any bearing on my attitude or my countenance or my mood or my demeanor because all of those things are bound up in the promises that I have of eternal life in Christ Jesus. The reality is, as the culture continues to get darker and darker, that the light of the gospel will shine brighter and brighter. I would argue that, at least in this country, the need has never been greater for Christians to embrace their calling to be a light, to be for a dark world a reflection of the light of Christ, the hope of the gospel. That's why this morning's passage, I believe, is so timely that God and his his sovereign control over all things, including the very passages that we're gathering to to study and and look at, uh, God has brought us to this text. I would argue that that this text is is, is the perfect text for this time. We see a time in the life of Jesus and the, the early life of Jesus beginning to call those together to himself and Jesus beginning to minister the gospel, a time of unique pressure and unique tension. I, even pressure and tension that was sort of pressing in on the Lord Jesus himself. In verses 7 through 12, we see that in Jesus' time, the need was extraordinary. The pressure was immense. And then in verses 13 to 19, we see how Jesus responds. If we look back at the nature of this particular point in Jesus' ministry, you'll remember we spent the last uh, several weeks looking at these series of five controversies that had occurred, these sort of five confrontations between Jesus and the religious leaders in Jerusalem, the Pharisees. Begin to understand that this time had to be a time of tremendous difficulty for Jesus in in ministry. A time of immense pressure for Jesus in ministry. I think sometimes we do the person of Jesus a disservice by only viewing Jesus through the lens of his deity. We sometimes forget that Jesus was human. He, He was fully God, yes, but he was also fully man and the pressures and the, the tension and the, the stress of doing ministry in the, the context of the, the time in which he was given had to have been un- un- unbelievably burdensome. He's fulfilling the ministry that he's been called to to preach the good news of the kingdom. Remember in chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus had been up all night. Mark tells us, healing the sick and casting out demons into the the late hours of the night, into the darkness of the nights. And he woke up the next morning after this intense night of of ministering to the needs of the people. And he sought to spend time alone. He withdrew to go and be alone with the Father in prayer. And even as he's there gathering, seeking time with the Father alone to sort of recoup and rejuvenate and, and, and focus on, on the things that God had called him to, if you'll recall, Peter comes sort of frantically looking for him and he says, Jesus, what are you doing? Where are you? You can't, you can't be out here all by yourself. The people need you. They're lining up. The need is great. You remember how Jesus responds in Chapter 138, Jesus responds to this immense need. Peter is pressing on him, and Jesus said, Let's go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that's why I came. Jesus came to preach 
the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom of God had come and had come in him. That all of the message of the prophets that the kingdom of God was coming was a future event which God's people should be anticipating and living in expectation of. Jesus came to preach, to proclaim that the, the gospel or the good news of the kingdom had come and had come because he was here. God had become man. Came to preach, but he was also busy healing people, and casting out demons in order that his preaching might be validated. And Jesus was very clear that the primary purpose for which I came was ultimately to, to go to the cross. I came to die so that people who are living in bondage to sin might be set free. I came to preach this message that there is freedom and forgiveness and reconciliation between God and man. And as he was preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, he was busying himself by healing the sick, casting out demons, that people might know that the message that he preached was a message of authority, that he had authority to proclaim freedom and forgiveness for sins, redemption between those who were alienated because of their sin. So as he's preaching and teaching and healing the sick and casting out demons, he finds that not only are there people who are continually coming to him and pressing in on him because they have great need, but there are also those who are already lining up in opposition to him. As he's going about preaching and casting out demons, we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, the religious elite, they're following his every step looking for an opportunity that they might accuse him. We've been looking at all of these instances culminates with the passage we looked at last week as Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. And in chapter 3, verse 6, it says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The pressure is immense. The needs of the sick the oppressed, the demon-possessed, are weighing heavy. The opposition of those who already were seeking to kill him was looming over him. In verse 7 of our passage this morning, Mark tells us that Jesus withdrew with his disciples. His, his intention was to withdraw, as was his pattern, either in response to a uniquely difficult time in ministry or in preparation for a uniquely difficult time in preparation. Jesus would frequently withdraw from the crowds, withdraw from everyone and seek a place of solitude that he might seek the will of his Father in order to be found obedient by the Father. And so Mark tells us in verse 7, Jesus wanted to get away. He withdrew with his disciples, but as he's withdrawing to, to get away, it says a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan from around Tyre and Sidon. A great crowd had heard all that he was doing and they came to him. The crowd, as Jesus is seeking to withdraw, it only gets bigger and bigger and bigger as this is now sort of expanded from the immediate area surrounding Jerusalem to more of a regional movement. The word of Jesus' fame and Jesus' authority and Jesus' ability to heal the sick and to cast out demons and to, 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 to fix the oppression of the day that is spreading and people are gathering to him. So much so, it seems like Jesus was actually somewhat concerned that this crowd might press in on them to the point that they were crushed. He told his disciples to have a boat ready because of the crowd that was gathering. People were flocking to Jesus. And the ministry seemed to become almost burdensome to Jesus as there were so many who needed to be healed and so many who needed demons cast out of them. And people began to realize that we don't even really have to have a personal interaction with Jesus. If we could just get close enough to touch him, they understood there's such power and such authority. People were literally pressing in on the Lord that they might touch him and be healed so bad that Jesus says, we got to get a boat. we, we got to get out of here. And so many people were trying to touch him. 
pressing in on him. And don't forget that there were the whole time while this great crowd is pressing in on him, those who were meeting and operating in dark places behind closed doors and plotting also how they might kill him. The need was immense. The pressure was immense. It was political pressure. Pharisees, followers of Herod, those who were sworn political enemies had agreed to conspire together to kill Jesus. The crowds of the sick and the needy were pressing in on Jesus, preventing him from withdrawing to be alone with the Father. Mark gives us this strange little phrase in verse 11. In the midst of all this political pressure which was mounting against Jesus and this real physical pressure of those who were pressing in on Jesus seeking to be killed or or to be healed rather, there was also a real spiritual pressure pressing in on Jesus. Mark says, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. The demons saw Jesus and they recognized him. They didn't do this because they saw him for who he was and desired to worship him. They did this as an attempt to claim power over him. It was commonly understood in this first century, in in this time and place that Jesus was ministering, that to, to call someone by their name gave you a certain amount of power over them. You can imagine yourself you decided to vacation in a foreign land, a land where you don't know anybody. You walk into a shop thinking you're there to simply do what tourists do, buy some trinkets and see some sights and take home some things. And someone that you've never met looks at you and calls you by name. It would be an eerily unsettling experience. How do you know me? What else do you know about me? Why are you calling me by name? The attempt of the demons to call Jesus by name was not an attempt to worship him, but rather to gain some level of power or control over him. Mark is describing for us a time of extraordinary need, extraordinary pressure. In the next part of the passage we're looking at, Jesus goes to extraordinary lengths to respond to this immense need. What does Jesus do? As the pressure is mounting, the needs are unbelievable. There's a political pressure, there's a a physical pressure, there's a, a spiritual pressure pressing in on him. And Jesus does something extraordinary. He begins to build a team. He, he goes and he says, we've, we, we've got, to, we, we've got to, to do something unique. We've got to do something new. We've got to do something different. And so Mark tells us in verse 13, he went up on the mountain and he called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. It's interesting, if you look at the parallel of this account in the book of Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus went up onto the mountain and all night he was on the mountain praying and seeking God for whom he might call. It wasn't just Jesus went and offered a quick 30-second prayer and then said, oh, we've got to get a team. Uh, You, 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 and you. All right, let's go. Let's do this thing. That's not what he did at all. He went to the Lord. Luke tells us he spent all night laboring in prayer with the Father and the Father revealed to him who he might call. It's a very interesting description of how Jesus goes about calling these apostles. Mark simply says he went up on the mountain and he called to him those whom he desired and they came to him and he appointed the twelve whom he also named apostles. But I want us to understand something. Jesus isn't just responding to a time of significant need in ministry by assembling a team to help with the workload. No, Jesus is doing something truly revolutionary here. He's doing something truly remarkable here. Mark tells us that Jesus here chooses for himself 12, that he might send them out to carry on the work that he's begun. Jesus didn't have a sign-up list. 
Now, Jesus didn't stand up and ask for volunteers. It, it, we're told, if we look at the, the gospel accounts of this one story, that Jesus gathered all of those around him who were already following him, his disciples, those who had already made some level of sacrifice and commitment. And from among those who were following Jesus, he chooses 12. This wasn't a volunteer mission. It seems that it's very important to the work that they understand that Jesus chose them. According to Mark, Jesus called them. In fact, it's so important that Jesus felt that he needed to reiterate this concept to these very apostles in the upper room as they were gathered together on the night before Jesus was going to be crucified on the cross. He says to them in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. It's interesting, I was speaking with someone just moments before the service started about the unique challenges of, of ministry during this time, the unique challenges that ministers of the gospel are, are facing. I saw a study this week that said that during this season, this coronavirus season, that 3,600 pastors uh, a month are leaving the ministry. Many because churches, some churches have been forced to, to close their doors as a result of uh, lack of finances or other issues, and uh, many others just because of the pressure and the weight of trying to minister during this season. And, and it seems like Jesus wanted these apostles to understand, especially in that room on the night before he was going to be crucified, things are going to get really difficult. And when they do, I want you to find comfort in this, that you didn't choose me, I chose you for this task. I called you to the task that I have appointed you to. And even in my own heart. Even, even during times of great distress, e even during times of, of great need and times where uh, there is a temptation, and, and I'm just confessing before you, I think it's true in the heart of every pastor, there are times when you look to a, a different situation, you go, you know what I would like? Sometimes, I'll tell you this, I'm bearing my soul. Sometimes I think my dream job would be a, a, a lawnmower on a golf course. There are days that I think, you know what would be really amazing? If I'd show up for work and somebody would tell me, today I need you to mow number three, number seven, number nine, and number 11. And I say, yes, sir. And I go and I mow all day and then I put my mower up and I go home. But in those moments where is the heart of a pastor, you're tempted to look to other things. I, I can tell you this for me, it, it's the same truth. Not that I'm placing myself on a, a level footing as the apostles, but it's the same truth that carries me forward and propels me forward that I know that I was called to this by God. This wasn't just something I chose. I didn't throw a dart at a list of occupations and decide, well, I'll be a preacher. That sounds fun and easy and really well-paying. No, that's... It's not how it works. It's not how it worked for the apostles. Mark wants us to know. Jesus wants the apostles to know. I chose you. What are the criteria? And we're looking at Jesus assembling this team of, of men who are going to carry on the work of gospel ministry and advancing the church and building the kingdom even after Jesus is, has departed from them. So I think it's important for us to look at the details. So what are the criteria by which Jesus chose these men? Well, Mark tells us the criteria. It says Jesus went up on the mountain and he called to him those whom he desired. Jesus chose who he wanted to choose. He chose according to his sovereign choosing alone. There wasn't some extra spiritual set of circumstances here. Jesus chose who he wanted to choose because he's God and he's sovereign and he understood the heart of these men. Jesus isn't here simply responding to the need by delegating some of his responsibilities He's doing something revolutionary. Remember when Jesus was questioned about fasting? 
He responded with a, an interesting little parable. The Pharisees come to Jesus and they said, why is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees, they fast, but your disciples, they don't fast. And Jesus gives them this illustration about a bridegroom that probably went completely over their head. And then he, he tells them this interesting uh, little, little parable about new cloth and old cloth and new wineskins and old wineskins. It, it's in Mark 2, beginning in verse 21. He says, nobody sews a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. New wine is for new wineskins. Jesus was instructing the Pharisees, I'm doing something different. Something unique is coming. Something new and completely incompatible with their old, antiquated way of thinking with regard to God and his kingdom. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us of this account. And they all find it important to inform us that Jesus chose, according to his own will... Twelve men to serve as apostles. Jesus is not just building on the past. He's doing something new. And Twelve is a very significant number in the Bible. If I were to ask you some, some questions about numbers, if I were to ask you how many representatives serve in the Oklahoma House of Representatives, I, I would imagine that probably very few of you could answer that question like with confidence. I know exactly what that number is. If I were to ask you how many Southern Baptist churches there are in the state of Oklahoma, I would imagine that very few of, of us could answer that question. I mean, another easier question. If I were to ask you how many Oklahomans have been in space, Perhaps maybe a few more of you could answer, but I, I would imagine that not an overwhelming majority of us could answer the questions that I have posed. But if I ask this question, how many tribes are there in Israel? I, I, I would imagine that most of you, especially if you've grown up in the church, could uh, be able to answer the questions. I'm going I'm to test my theory here. This is an actual time of response, not a rhetorical question. I'm going to ask the question, how many tribes are there in Israel? There's 12 tribes in Israel. This is a fact that we all know. Certainly, everyone in Jesus' day would understand this. The number 12 is insignificant because the number 12 is synonymous with God's establishment of Israel. Because Jacob, who became Israel, had 12 sons. There's 12 tribes in Israel. So what's Jesus doing here? He establishes the new 12. He's beginning to establish a new Israel, a new people, a people that God is gathering from every tribe and tongue and nation to himself. It's a time of extraordinary need, and so Jesus places an extraordinary calling on the lives of 12 very ordinary men. These men were called to Jesus in order that they might be sent out by Jesus. And I want us to think for uh, just a moment about the list of men that Jesus has gathered to himself. I mean, if we're thinking of ourselves, we're about to start a new movement or launch a, a new company or a new political party. We're doing something completely new, the kind of people that we might want to assemble. We would be looking for the most talented, the most created, or creative, rather, the most educated, the most reputable, people who are well-connected and well-resourced, people who have a vast network of influential people that they can gather together. And we look at this list of those who Jesus chose. Who did he choose? There's not one Pharisee, not one scribe, not one Sadducee, not one political leader. There is nobody of influence on this list. They are a bunch of nobodies. Look at a few examples. One of the men who's listed as the, this group of 12 that Jesus is calling to himself in order that he might send them out to, to, to continue the work of, of ministry after he's gone, he, he called Thomas. Thomas became the great apostle to India. 
whose influence in India is still being felt in very real ways today over 2,000 years later. The same guy who said after the resurrection of Jesus, now I don't believe that you really saw Jesus resurrected. In fact, I'm not going to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, even though he told us he was going to. I'm not going to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead until I could put my hands in his side and touch the holes in his hands and his feet. He chose doubting Thomas, who once he did touch the resurrected Lord Jesus, he proclaimed, my Lord and my God. What about John? John was the great uh, apostle of, of love. John was the, the most beloved of all of those apostles of Jesus. John was the only apostle who lived to die of an old age. He died in exile on the Isle of Patmos. And according to church historians, his final words to the church as an aged man before his death, he instructed the church with the very last words he could mutter. He said... Love one another. The apostle of love. Well, John, at another point in his life, when Jesus was facing a little bit of opposition, Jesus wanted to call down fire from heaven on all of those who didn't believe. The same guy that when Jesus was giving this passionate speech about how he was going to suffer and die and be mocked and spit on and rejected, John and his brother James immediately responded by saying, hey, yeah, that's cool. But when you ascend to your throne, could you have one of us sit on your right and one of us sit on your left? He chose John. Maybe you didn't think about this. Jesus chose the political arch enemies. He chose Matthew, the tax collector, who had forsaken his own people and sworn allegiance to Rome so that he could become rich. And he also chose Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were those trying to overthrow the Romans by any means necessary, trying to launch a political coup, a a revolution, a a military action against Rome. Jesus is going to put a liberal Democrat and an extremely conservative Republican on this team, and they're going to serve the kingdom together. Maybe the most amazing of all that Jesus chose is Peter. His name was Simon, but Jesus gave him a new name. Peter, which means rock. This rock in the moment of Jesus' greatest need. When the Lord needed him the most, as Jesus was facing his greatest trial... Peter's scared, he's ashamed, denying that he even knew Jesus. In the midst of this extraordinary pressure, political pressure, physical pressure, spiritual pressure, Jesus chose 12 ordinary men to establish the church in power. The book of Acts records how these men empowered by the Holy Spirit. This Peter who was ashamed and afraid as Jesus was being crucified goes on to preach perhaps the most powerful sermon ever preached on the day of Pentecost. They went on to carry the gospel throughout the entire known world and plant churches everywhere they went. They went on in the power of the Holy Spirit is given to them by Jesus to do the very things that Jesus said he called them to do, to go out, to preach the gospel, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to continue the work that he had called them to. So what does this mean for us? Though we haven't been called to the office of apostle as these 12 men were, Certainly we have been called, and certainly we have been sent out. You look to the book of Ephesians as Paul, who would later be called as an apostle, is writing to the church in Ephesus about how they are to, to live and, and to walk. Paul says this to the Ephesians in 
Ephesians 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Paul wants the church to know, and I want you to know, church, you're not an apostle, but yes, you have been called by Jesus. You've been called by Jesus for his purposes, to walk in a manner worthy of this calling to which you've been called. Paul goes on to say this is what it looks like, that we're to walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body One spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Listen, Christian, make no mistake about it. These are extraordinary times. But you've been called. You've been called To walk in a manner worthy of God. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Paul goes on to show what it looks like to be those who are called. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice To God, we have been called. If you're a Christian, you have been called into relationship with God through Christ. You responded to that call by believing and trusting in Christ and turning from sin. You've been called to Christ just as the apostles were called. We also have been called. And just as they were sent out, we also have been sent out. Jesus, shortly before he was going to ascend to be with the Father gathers together with him those who had been called. And he tells him this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Listen, Christian, we have been called. We have been equipped. And God's purpose for this church and for every Christ-exalting, Bible-believing church is that we would be sent out just as the apostles were sent out to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We live in extraordinary times. The church is facing extraordinary circumstances. And just as he was during the time of the apostles, God is raising up ordinary people to reach the lost with the life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are those who have believed and understood and internalized this truth that though we were once separated from God because of our sin, God, in his great love for us, sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who would perfectly walk in obedience through his entire life. And though he did nothing for which he deserved death, he willingly went to death on a cross so that all who might come to him in faith can be saved. Not only did he die, but three days later, he rose. So that all who identify with Christ in his death have the promise of eternal life as the one who conquered death. So let's understand this truth. We're here because we've been called. And our purpose is to be sent out to live in a manner worthy of our calling. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these great and glorious truths. And God, I I pray right now against a spirit of apathy. God, I pray that your spirit would be actively at work in the hearts of all who hear your word, who have heard your word proclaimed. We believe that we gathered here not to hear from a man, Lord, but to hear from you. And having heard from you, God, I pray that your spirit would work in all who received this message that we would be stirred to action, 
to boldly embrace the calling to which we have been called. To boldly embrace the ministry to which we have been sent out. God, we understand that we stand on the shoulders of spiritual giants. These men, these apostles called to go out in power, having given apostolic authority to establish the church, God, and that the, the, we are here gathered this morning as a, as a direct result of their faithfulness to plant churches that planted churches that planted churches to preach the gospel to people who would preach the gospel teach and instruct faithful men who would teach and instruct other faithful men and for over 2,000 years you've been pleased Lord to continue the message of the apostles in advancing the kingdom. God, I pray that we would embrace these two truths. That we've been called. And that it's your will for our lives that we be sent out. Father, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's our conviction in this church that every single time the Word of God is proclaimed that the people of God should respond. And we give you an opportunity to respond. And maybe some of you want to come forward and speak to one of the pastors will be available at the front. Maybe you need to respond by turning from sin and trusting in Christ. Maybe your eyes have been opened to the truth of the gospel this morning. And you understand now that you've never really embraced this calling. You've never responded to Jesus in faith by trusting him. Maybe you need to come forward and talk to one of the pastors about trusting Christ for the first time. Or maybe you're convicted of some sin. Maybe it's the sin of apathy. Maybe you've just been going through life and thinking the whole purpose of all of this that we do here is so that you just might become a better person. That ain't it. We're gathered here as people who have been called out of the world. People who are committing to being sent back into the world to do the work to which we've been called. Maybe you need to just re repent of, of apathy. You, you can do that where you're at. Crying out to God, confessing that you've been apathetic. Maybe you want to come and pray at the front or come and pray with the pastor. Maybe it's something else. I don't know what the Lord is prompting each of you to do. But as I said, it's our conviction, deeply held conviction, that every time the Word of God is proclaimed, the people of God are called to respond. So let's respond together. Would you please stand and sing with us as we respond in song?